Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight on behalf of the Leo Beck Institute and the Association of Jewish Music, along with Michael Levitt, who's here, who runs um, the association. I want to welcome you to the Center for Jewish History. My name is Billy Weitzer. I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute. And for those of you who don't know the Leo Beck Institute, our mission is to preserve and promote the history and culture of German-speaking Jewry. Our research library and archive contain the most significant collection of source material relating to the history of German-speaking Jews. We take pride in the centuries of accomplishments of German Jews, but we also document the tragic destruction of that culture by the Nazis. Tonight, of course, commemorates one of those, one of the most memorable events in um, 12 years of terrible events, perhaps even the turning point in that history, Kristallnacht, also known as the Night of Broken Glass, also known as the November Pogrom. I do want to get to our program where we will commemorate this event in multiple ways, a brief lecture, a short documentary film, and a musical tribute. But briefly, I wanted to put this day in the context of the year 1938 and call your attention to LBI's 1938 project if you don't know about it already. Through an exhibition upstairs and a website, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, we're telling a personal story from every day in 1938. Of course, that will include stories around Kristallnacht and around the Kindertransport, which we will celebrate the 80th, commemorate the 80th anniversary of that, um, the beginning of that uh, at the end, at the, it began in the beginning of December, and on November 26th, we have an uh, opening of an exhibit here on Kindertransport that you're all invited to attend. So at other events like that, I will gladly share the goals of the 1938 project and what we are doing here and uh, around the country and around the world to promote the history of German-speaking Jewry. But I would rather quickly give you a sense of the program, and then I will not come up in between acts, as if you will, so that we can move right along. We will begin with remarks from Professor Marion Kaplan from NYU. The program describes her work, and it demonstrates why we asked Marion to speak first about Kristallnacht. Marion's pioneering scholarship and publications on German Jewish women's history and European women's history exemplify how the narrative of everyday lives, the narratives of everyday life, are critical to the understanding of history. Marion also serves on both LBI's and the Center's academic advisory board and has been a great friend and advisor to me in my role, so I welcome her. Immediately following Marion, we will show a 10-minute documentary from individuals who shared with us their memories of the year 1938. At least three of those people are here tonight that I know of, and I apologize if I missed anybody else, but I hope not. Dr. Ruth Westheimer, Ilsa Melamed, and Marianne Salinger, and I thank all three of you for coming tonight and for participating in this project and um, you're all in the 10-minute film, but also we've preserved the one-hour interviews that we did with each of you, and they will be held in our archive. After that brief film, Martin Goldsmith will introduce the Phoenix Cha Chamber Ensemble. His biography in the program covers his extensive experience as a producer, announcer, reviewer of classical music in print and on the air. But I want to point out that you'll also hear stories of his parents and the Kulturbund, an organization in Germany that hired Jewish artists, musicians, and actors who were otherwise unable to perform due to Nazi prohibitions. So without further ado, I believe you are in for an extraordinary evening that will pay appropriate tribute to the events that we must never forget. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here tonight, both as a commemoration and as a, uh, mem well, as a memorial for Kristallnacht. Um, this is going to be PowerPoint. I'm not so good at PowerPoint, so bear with me. Um, oh, good, it's up there already. Great. Um, I'm going to talk about Jewish women and families between 1933 and then focus on 1938 
With the Nazi seizure of power, Germany's approximately 500,000 Jews had to begin to struggle for daily survival. Forced into a process of separation and then segregation that took about six years. Nazi repression occurred in irregular and unpredictable steps. Despite what appears in hindsight to be the increasing speed and clarity of persecution, Nazi policy followed what has been described as a twisted road to Auschwitz. Contradictory pronouncements, regional variations, lack of coordination, and the attempt to appear moderate to other nations gave contemporaries profoundly mixed signals. For Jews, the concept of normal became increasingly elastic even as conditions got worse. As memoirs and interviews indicate, some Jews longed to make life normal again within the ever narrowing boundaries drawn by the Nazis. Others denied what they saw happening. For many, it was a combination of both at the same time the desire and need to believe that they and their families could remain in their homeland, even under new and trying conditions. What were some of these signals? Not surprisingly, the Nazis initiated a two-pronged attack on Jews. Political signals came first, followed quickly by economic discrimination. In 1933, the government immediately turned on the left, attacking and interning in quickly built concentration camps, socialists, communists, and liberals, as well as former antagonists, including journalists, lawyers, and so on. If one happened to be a Jew as well, the consequences were even more dire. The photo you see behind me is of Dachau, one of the first concentration camps. Just as quickly, on April 1st, 1933, the German government declared a boycott of Jewish businesses. Although the boycott was called off after one day, it frightened Jews and continued unofficially and sporadically through the 1930s until the Nazis completely Aryanized, that's their word, or confiscated, that's a better word, Jewish businesses. Immediately after the so-called April Laws of 1933, about half of Jewish judges, prosecutors, and almost a third of Jewish lawyers lost their jobs. A fourth of Jewish doctors lost their German National Health Insurance affiliation. In September, the Nazis excluded Jews from the worlds of art, film, music, literature, and journalism. Restrictions, official and unofficial harassment, and economic boycotts all increased in their frequency and fervor. German Jews had been a predominantly middle class group, heavily represented in business fields and in the professions. However, as many as one third of Jews in Germany received some form of public assistance by 1935. A few months later in September, the Nazis turned their racism into policy. The law for the protection of German blood and honor, prohibited marriages and extramarital intercourse between those of, quote, Jewish blood and Germans, and forbade the employment of German females under 45 in Jewish households. It also reduced Jews to, quote, state subjects rather than full-fledged citizens. A momentary lull in official propaganda occurred the year later in 1936 during the Olympics although local separation and economic boycotts did continue. Despite political exclusion and economic downward mobility, the Jewish community rose to assist its people, often with the help of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. Jewish organizations provided educational, emigration, cultural, and social welfare assistance. One example will have to suffice. The Jewish Kulturbund, um, or cultural association, managed to employ several thousand unemployed Jewish artists, writers, actors, and musicians to entertain tens of thousands of Jews who could no longer attend what were called German cultural events. Social ostracism went along with political and economic damage. One of the first signs was the disassociation of former friends. Memoirs are replete with personal disappointment. One woman reported that she had stopped attending a monthly cafe clutch, not wanting to embarrass her non-Jewish friends, but one day she met one of the women who assured her they would all welcome her. 
However, when she arrived at the cafe, no one was there. But, she wrote, I could not blame them. Why should they have risked the loss of their jobs only to prove to me that Jews could still have friends in Germany? She added, with each day of the Nazi regime, the abyss between us and our fellow citizens grew larger. Friends whom we had loved for years did not know us anymore. And while most avoided them, other, out, others outright barred them from previous social gatherings. Many organizations swiftly Nazified themselves, expelling Jewish members, even before they had to. Philosopher Hannah Arendt reflected, quote, our friends Nazified themselves. The problem, after all, was not what our enemies did, but what our friends did. Of course, not all Germans abandoned their Jewish friends. Acts of simple neighborly decency, as little as a good morning greeting, or as much as a warning that the secret police were watching, came as great relief. They meant there were some, quote, good Germans. But the government intended to completely isolate Jews, and by 1936, the Nazis had brought off a deepening of the gap between Jews and other Germans. Companionship with non-Jews became the, the exception. General social ostracism accompanied the loss of friends as Germans began to treat each other with reserve and suspicion. They broke decisively with Jews. Neighbors turned away most abruptly in small towns and villages where about 17% of the Jewish population still lived. Strangers also made life miserable for Jews, pointing them out on the street, in buses, in stores, and often also getting it wrong, since most Jews did not look different from most Germans. The yellow star required in sep September 1941 is proof of that fact. Yet despite the irregular but ultimately irreversible ostracism, the mixed signals continued. In 1933, a 10-year-old observed Nazis marching with placards reading, quote, Germans don't buy from Jews. World Jewry wants to destroy Germany. Germans defend yourselves. But in 1935, her father was still decorated for active service in the past war, receiving a citation signed by the chief of police of Berlin. It is common from hindsight to criticize Jews for not having emigrated quickly enough and hoping they could still remain in Germany, or for loving Germany too much, or for not seeing the writing that was on the wall. This is a serious distortion. Contrary to popular misconceptions, as the Nazi noose tightened, German Jews did flee starting in 1933. By the end of 38, before the November pogrom, almost 160,000 Jews had fled already. Additionally, 140,000 Jews fled Austria in the wake of Germany's annexation in March 38. But emigration remained extremely difficult. The Nazi government made sure to impoverish Jews before they left and created many obstacles in their paths, despite claiming that the Nazis wanted to get rid of Jews. Also, individual agents plundered Jewish emigres' belongings. Most importantly, the worldwide depression caused countries of refuge to restrict immigration. In July 1938, 32 countries, assembled by Franklin Roosevelt in Evian, France, that's not Franklin Roosevelt, that's uh, someone else at Evian, regretted that they could not take in more Jews. And those few with open doors insisted on farmers, not business or professional people. These statistics may give the impression that a certain number of Jews smoothly managed to leave Germany. I just said 160,000. The statistics cover up the individual stories which describe complicated emigration attempts, failures, and new attempts. Gallo's humor makes the point. If one studied Spanish or Portuguese to go to Latin America, sudden barriers to entry arose and one had to prepare for another country. If one turned to Hebrew, obstacles to acquiring the necessary certificates were certain to develop and one couldn't get into Palestine. Thus, a joke made the rounds of one town. The question was, what language are you learning? And the answer was, the wrong one, of course. 
Turning to the year 1938, we notice an increase in persecution. First, there was the annexation or the Anschluss of Austria, which was uh, very, very violent, particularly against Jews. Uh, there were street humiliations. You've all seen photos probably of Jews being forced to clean the streets with toothbrushes. About 192,000 Jews uh, were in Austria and, and specifically in Vienna. About 57,000 left the following, that, the following few months. Um, but then also the Nazis deprived Jewish congregations in Germany and in Austria, Austria was now greater Germany, of legal protection. Then in the spring, Jews had to report the value of their property and register all commercial establishments. More ominously, the Nazis rounded up 1,500 alleged, quote, anti-social Jewish men and incarcerated them in the June action, claiming they were criminals, although 500 only had traffic violations. That summer, the Nazis destroyed three synagogues, Munich, Nuremberg, and Dortmund, and required the letter J on passports of Jews. It was the deportation, however, of Polish Jews that sparked the incident that led to the November pogrom. Germany expelled 17,000 Polish Jews, many of them resident in Germany for generations, and sent them to the Polish border where the Poles denied them entrance. The manner in which the Polish Jews were deported foreshadowed the brutality to come. Without warning, officials arrived at their homes, gave them a few minutes to pack necessities, herded them away, sweeping up Jews without regard to age or sex. German Jews involved in relief activities for those deported felt an immediate threat to themselves as well. Women who brought food to the trainloads of deportees wondered, quote, and who will bring us bread and butter at the train? Herschel Greenspan, a young man whose parents were among those deportees, was driven to despair at the plight, at their plight, and on November 7th shot the Nazi diplomat Ernst von Rath at the German embassy in Paris. The Nazis used the death of von Rath two days later as a convenient excuse to launch their largest pogrom to date, starting on November 9th. Organized by the government and supported by local mobs, the attacks ranged from assailants wielding hatchets and axes to destroy Jewish homes and businesses to groups using incendiary bombs and dy dynamite to destroy synagogues. Mobs plundered Jewish property. The Nazis also invaded Jewish hospitals, old age homes, and orphanages. Finally, the Nazis systematically rounded up 30,000 Jewish men and imprisoned them in the Buchenwald, Dachau, and Sachsenhausen concentration camps. Their brutality, humiliation, and outright murder reigned. The November pogrom claimed the lives of at least 100 Jews, not including the deaths or suicides that occurred immediately thereafter. Moreover, the men who were lucky enough to return from internment, quote, with shaved heads, unrecognizably dirty, and with frozen limbs, end quote, were often physically and psychologically ravaged. The pogrom also destroyed hundreds of synagogues and countless homes and shops. One of the lasting images of this pogrom is that of crystal, the broken glass from synagogues and stores scattered on the streets the next day. While it was happening, the Nazis referred to it with a typically bureaucratic euphemism as the Jew action. Afterwards, it became known as Kristallnacht or Reichskristallnacht, Crystal Night. A powerful, if more mundane, image mentioned often in Jewish women's memoirs is that of flying feathers, feathers covering the internal space of the home, the hallway, the front yard, or courtyard. Similar to pogroms in Russia at the turn of the century, the marauders tore up goose feather blankets and pillows, shaking them into the rooms, out the windows, down the stairs. Jews were thus bereft of their bedding, and with that, the kind of physical and psychological security and comfort that this represented, and that they had once known at home. Broken glass in public and strewn feather beds in private spelled the end of Jewish security in Germany. 
The image of feathers flying is one of a domestic scene gravely disturbed. This was women's primary experience of the pogrom. The marauders arrested and beat up men. There were exceptions. Some women were publicly humiliated, bloodied, beaten, and murdered. Nonetheless, most women were forced to stand by and watch their homes torn apart and their men abused. Later, they were to anguish as the men disappeared into camps and then try heroically to rescue them, for the most part, by struggling to get emigration papers. If emigration had been slow but steady in the early Nazi years, the November pogrom caused a massive speed up. Rescuing their men was the most crucial task confronting Jewish women in the days following the pogrom. Wives, mothers, and daughters of prisoners were told that their men would be released only if they could present emigration papers. Women summoned the courage to overcome gender stereotypes of passivity in order to find any means to have their men freed from camps. One woman whose husband was in hiding teamed up with a friend whose husband had taken, been taken to Dachau. Quote, we ran from early morning to late evening. Nothing mattered anymore except to save your family. Charlotte Stein Pick wrote of the November pogrom, quote, from this hour on, I tried untiringly day in, in and day out to find a connection that could lead to my husband's release. I ran to Christian acquaintances, friends, colleagues, but everyone, everywhere people shrugged their shoulders, shook their heads, and said no. And everyone was glad when I left. I was treated like a leper, even by people who were positively inclined towards us. Ruth Abraham impressed her family, but also the SS with her determination and bravery. During the November program, she traveled to Dachau to ask for the release of her future father-in-law. Arriving at the concentration camp in a bus filled with SS men, she was deposited inside the camp where she was ignored. She assumed that because of her, quote, Aryan looks, her blonde hair and blue eyes, she was taken for a member of the League of German Girls. Finally, she requested an interview with the commandant and begged for the release of her fa elderly father-in-law. She succeeded, again attributing her success to her looks, since the men who helped her refused to believe she was a, quote, full Jew, and seemed to take pity on her. Abraham's highly unconventional behavior found a more conventional reward. The couple married immediately. The rabbi who performed the ceremony did so with bandaged hands, an indication of the treatment he had received in a concentration camp. Some women not only arranged the release of loved ones, but also sold property and made all the emigration decisions. Accompanying her husband home after his ordeal in a camp, one wife announced that she had just sold the house, bought tickets of all places to Shanghai for the whole family. Her husband reflected, anything was okay with me, only not to stay in a land in which everyone had declared open season on us. Edith Bick recalled in an interview in 1972 that, quote, when my husband was in a concentration camp, whatever there was, I had to do, which I had never done before, never. He didn't like it, but he not only accepted it, he was thankful. One prominent lawyer, rescued by his wife, wrote about the November pogrom, quote, our wives worked tirelessly, tirelessly to obtain our release. Women thought nothing of going to authorities we, where we normally did not approach without a good deal of trepidation. Similar expressions of thankfulness, tinged perhaps with a bit of surprise at women's heroism, can be found in many men's memoirs. They continued to be indebted to women even after their or ordeal, when many men were too beaten in body and spirit to be of much use in the scramble to emigrate. Once the Nazis began releasing some men, women organized emergency assistance near the concentration camps. At the Weimar train station, a group of Jewish women waited for men freed from Buchenwald. They gave them coffee, fresh socks, handkerchiefs, chiffs, and tried to clean their clothing a bit before sending them to the destinations. But not all Jewish men were that lucky. Quote, on a daily basis, one heard that the ashes of a dead person had been delivered to this or that family. These urns were sent COD, for which the post office took the sum of 3.75 marks. It is striking that in the testimony of both men and women, women's calm, dry-eyed self-control is emphasized. 
For example, a Jewish community leader wrote, quote, the highest praise during these days goes to our wives who without shedding one tear inspired the hordes, some of whom had, been, had beaten their men bloody. Unbroken, these women did everything to have their men freed as soon as possible, end quote. Charlotte Stein Pick recalled her husband's counsel on the day of the pogrom. Just no tears and no scene, he said to her. In German, that's nur keine Tränen und keine Szene, so it kind of rhymes. But even without this warning, she added, I would have controlled myself. Hannah Bernheim, remembering the pain of being forced to hand over prized family heirlooms to the, heirlooms to the Nazis some months after the pogrom, reflected on the dignity and self-control of the Jewish people around her and on her own form of defiance. She wrote, quote, I was glad that the Jews I saw didn't show how upset they were, end quote. During an onerous government inspection of the property with which she hoped to emigrate in 39, she recalled, quote, they asked a lot of questions to confound us, but I darned my socks and acted very quietly. When the Nazis confiscated all of her valuable rituals, objects, and jewelry, a Hamburg woman wrote a poem to express both her sadness and her quiet defiance. Despite her grief, she ended with, quote, I will separate myself without tears. Jewish women sustained their dignity by remembering who they really were, not who their enemies said they were. This desire to appear calm was not merely a proclamation of female stalwartness to counter the stereotype of female frailty. Emphasis on composure also resulted from the decorum stressed in Jewish middle class upbringing. It asserted Jewish pride in the face of Aryan savagery, bourgeois comportment in the face of the rabble, human dignity in the face of bar barbarism. Outward calm notwithstanding, women's inner stress was massive as they faced the dizzy dizzying procedure of obtaining proof of immediate plans to emigrate in order to free a relative from a concentration camp. Still, they facilitated the exodus of thousands. In 1940, 79,000 German Jews emigrated. In short, in less than eight years, and drastically increasing after the November pogrom, two-thirds of German Jews emigrated. The November pogrom served as a major rupture, a before and after moment in German and Jewish history, after which the Nazis accelerated their economic and social persecution, confiscated Jewish businesses and personal property, banned Jewish children from public schools, demanded forced labor of able-bodied men and women, and added the names Sarah and Israel to Jewish names. The war worsened already dire conditions for Jews. Those German Jews unable to save themselves were trapped by Nazi viciousness and by the unwillingness of countries of refuge to have them. Tragically, the remaining German Jews faced the war and much worse. Thank you. essential memories are. You know, we are who we are because of what we learn and what we remember. It's essential to identity. It is our identity. Up until 1938, we had a comparative, comparative freedom. In other words, we were able to go to restaurants, we were able to go to the movies, we were able to go to the theater. We had German and or I should say Jewish and non-Jewish friends. And for many, many years, I was not aware that I was different. I was an enthusiastic Boy Scout and a student and interested in playing football. That's about it. 
and privately I took French lessons and piano, not with great success, but... I had a wonderful childhood. I had a grandmother all to myself. I had 30 dolls. I had roller skates. I went to a private school from 19... Uh, 30 to 33, um, called Weinholze Privatschule, and um, where the teachers were called aunt and uncle. And uh, it was a mixed school, boys, uh, boys and girls, and non-Jews and Jews. I was proud to be a Jew, and when we had to be as a star, Jewish star, I would never would hide it. I was proud. I said, everybody knows I'm Jewish. Then there came a day, I don't remember any discussion beforehand, when I was told that I could no longer go to that school. Teachers on the, uh, in the corridors, for instance, we had to greet them by raising our hands and saying, Hi, Hitler. I had a German girlfriend whom I adored. She was everything I was not. She was thin, slim, she had long hair, she wore glasses. And one day, my mother picked us up someplace and she raised her elegant, thin arm and said, Heil Hitler, Frau Salinger. There was a billboard sort of in the center of town. Ironically, it was placed right across the street from the synagogue in town. And on it, every week were placed pages from a Nazi newspaper called Der Stürmer. And of course, the pages that were shown always showed caricatures of, in addition to articles, caricatures of Jews, which were, uh, for want of a better word at this time, comic because it was so exaggerated. Everything they took away from us. So my father would say, let them have everything. The life they would live up, give us, life they wouldn't take from us. We didn't really think that would happen in Austria. Hitler invaded on the 12th of March, 38. And the next thing I remember very vividly is the strong troopers marching down the narrow street that was at the side of our apartment building. That uh, Nazi march, um, you know, the sound of the boots on the ground of, and put, can put the fear. And we heard on the radio, which we listened to with, uh, with earphones, um, how in 200,000 people in Heldenplatz welcome Hitler with the most amazing enthusiasm you could imagine. And after the Anschluss, everybody was soon aware of a wave of arrests that took place of anyone who would conceivably oppose the Nazis. And all of a sudden, they fired all the Jewish assistant associate for professors. There's a chance for you to move up. So this was fantastic for the non-Jewish academics, and they've took full advantage of it. The difference of feeling now to my last um, period in Vienna, when you couldn't walk on the street without dread of something. You know, this total insecurity of the surrounding population uh, that proved themselves untrustworthy. She said, let me write to the cousins. So he said, all right. She wrote to the cousins, and by return mail, we had the affidavit for five, for four people, and that's what saved us our lives. I mean, America did not exactly make it easy. That's a myth, the open arms of the Statue of Liberty. 
I think that's unfortunately not true. It wasn't true then and it is not true now. I recall that when we wanted to leave, people said to my mother, uh, Mrs. Mosheim, this is not really goodbye. It's just temporary. We know you're going to be back within six months or so when all this blows over. And then, of course, came Kristallnacht, and that changed everything. I climbed through the window to see inside, and it was horrible. It was a sight I will never forget. Everything was burned. The Torah scrolls were just thrown in, in, into a bin, and they were half burned. The altar was burned. And I stood there, and I took off a little piece of the Torah, which was against the rules, and a little piece of the altar, and I pasted it in, into my sitter. And I hadn't realized how many stores had been, uh, had been Jewish stores. But they knew which ones were, and, and they just ransacked them. And that had happened during the night when we were sleeping. That morning, after the night of broken glass, the Nazis came to the apartment. Uh, there were, there was no hitting. Uh, there were, I do remember their big black boots. They told my father to get dressed and to go with him. And I do remember my grandmother. In those days, they had long skirts. I remember my grandmother taking out some money from the seam of her skirt, give it to the Nazi, and say, take good care of my son. My father then went outside and mounted a truck in front of the house. I couldn't see what was in the truck, uh, but I could see him turning around, giving me a smile and a wave, and that was the last time I ever saw my father. I was selected to the last kinder transport to Sweden in August of 1939. The Swedes <clears throat> saved my life by taking me in, right? Because if I hadn't gone to Sweden, ultimately, I would, would, would have ended in a gas chamber. Somebody had the bright idea of having all the kids in the train sing a certain Austrian folk songs, folk song, Musiden, Musiden zum Städtle hinaus, which means, must I, must I leave my little town? And I see the comfortable <coughs> demeanor of the people who are sitting there. You know, they're enjoying life, they feel, they feel connected, they feel this is what they, where they come from, this is what they are, this is where they want to be. And this, this kind of feeling has been taken away from me. I think people never learn. It's still going on in the world, but shouldn't be. Truth is that the greedy, uh, power crazy people have to be watched early on. The fact is that uh, under the right circumstances, you can make people believe in anything because they, there's a tribal instinct in us. We want to belong. We want to belong to a group. We want to be suspicious of people who are different, who come from a different place. And that can be exploited by political parties, by demagogues of any kind. The only protection is to have a very strong democratic tradition. And I realize how absolutely essential memories are. You know, we are who we are because of what we learn and what we...
Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, as Professor Kaplan said, it's a great honor to be here with you this evening. Professor Kaplan mentioned briefly the extraordinary organization, uh, the Jüdischer Kulturbund. Um, I guess the gentleman is about to come down to help me with my very few slides, because I'm something of a computer illiterate. So a, a few years ago, I wrote a book called The Inextinguishable Symphony, a true story of music and love in Nazi Germany, in which I told the story of my parents who played in this extraordinary organization called the Jüdische Kulturbund. I can't seem to get these to stop. Um, yes, the, the, the Nazis had many things on their plate, many things they hoped to accomplish after Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in uh, January of 1933. One of the very first things they did do was to evict Jews from their positions. Now, how do I stop this? Someone must know. Talk amongst yourselves. Ah. 
Dankeschön. How do we keep it from scrolling through? It worked so well in rehearsal. No, I mean, the only thing I can think to do is... Hang on one second. I think I figured this out. Now. One second. deal with this, mm -hmm. like going to each one, sure. Sure. you know what I'm saying? I think so. And then you'll just have to, you know, escape and go to the next picture. I mean, I can't, I don't know why that setting is on. It shouldn't be on. Just all of a sudden it's having a problem. Is, is that... Is that gonna mess you up to do that? Probably. Why don't we just kill it? I mean, you wanna put just this slide on? So at least there's something. Okay. Why don't you talk about the pictures first? Okay. One at a time, and then you tell your narrative. I mean, the other thing I could do is, um, if you give me a second, I might be able to run them from the booth. No, yeah, maybe we can just, just, pictures aren't really We're slaves to technology. As I said, some years ago I wrote, a, I wrote a book by the name of The Inextinguishable Symphony, a true story of music and love in Nazi Germany, in which I told the story of my parents. You saw my mother as a, uh, an 18-year-old and my father as a 22-year-old, um, and then the two of them playing in Berlin in 1940. Uh, with uh, a violinist named Henry Meyer, Hans Meyer, who came to this country and was a longtime member of the, the La Salle String Quartet. But the, uh, the book was largely about this amazing organization that Professor Kaplan referred to in her talk, the Jüdische Kulturbund, the Jewish Cultural Association. 
Uh, the Jews, the, the Nazis had many things on their plate when they, when Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in January of 1933. One of the first things they did was to evict Jewish actors, singers, and musicians from their positions with German orchestras, theater companies, and opera companies. And so in the uh, late spring, early summer of 1933, a man by the name of Kurt Singer, who was a neurologist and also a conductor, met with a Nazi official named Hans Hinkel. Hans Hinkel worked for Dr. Joseph Goebbels, who was the minister of what was called the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. And both Herr Hinkel and Dr. Goebbels saw this idea of a, an all-Jewish performing ensemble to be a very good propaganda tool. They could address the concerns of the rest of the world, such as they were, by deflecting them, by saying, well, look, the Jews have their own opera company, their own orchestra, their own theater company. These stories you have heard of how we're treating the Jews badly are just fairy tales. Pay no attention to them. So Dr. Singer began having received official approval from the Nazi regime, began to let it be known that this Jewish organization was coming together. And some of the very finest artists in Germany joined the Kulturbund. Uh, by no means was this some sort of Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland, hey kids, let's put on a show organization. Some of the very finest artists uh, came together to form the Kulturbund. In the initial Kulturbund ensemble, which uh, gathered together in Berlin, there, in the violin section of the orchestra, there were six former concertmasters of German orchestras before they had been kicked out of those, those positions. The Kulturbund opened its doors on October 1st, 1933, with the production of a play called Nathan der Weise, Nathan the Wise, by Gotthold Lessing. And ironically enough, it is a play about religious toleration. And so that performance on October 1st, 1933, was the first and last time that Nathan der Weise was performed by the Kulturbund. But they did some really extraordinary work. The first production in Germany of the play Six Characters in Search of an Author by Luigi Pirandello was a Kulturbund production. Uh, the first, op first time that uh, the opera Nabucco by Giuseppe Verdi was performed in Germany, it was a Kulturbund production. The conductor Hans Wilhelm Steinberg was a conductor with the Kulturbund. He later emigrated first to Palestine and then to the United States, and under the name William Steinberg, conducted orchestras in Buffalo, Boston, and Pittsburgh. Uh, William Steinberg, a very important conductor here in America in the uh, second half of the 20th century. The violist Boris Kreut, for many years the violist of the Budapest String Quartet in residence at the Library of Congress in Washington. He was a member of the Kulturbund, as was Ernst Drucker, the father of Eugene Drucker. Many of you know Gene Drucker as a member of the Emerson String Quartet. His father, Ernst Drucker, was the um, concertmaster of the Kulturbund Orchestra in Frankfurt. He later emigrated to this country and was a member of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra here in New York City. As I say, the Kulturbund opened its doors on October 1st, 1933, in Berlin with that production of Nathan der Weise. Within a couple of weeks, they had put on a production of Mozart's opera, The Marriage of Figaro, and by the end of 1933, the first branch organization of the Kulturbund opened in, um, in Cologne. And by 1935, there were 49 Kulturbund organizations across Germany, and more than 75,000 German Jews were card-carrying subscribers to the Kulturbund. In order to perform with the Kulturbund, in order to uh, be a violinist or a pianist or a flutist or a dancer or an actor or to build sets and costumes, to clean the lavatories, to do anything connected to the Kulturbund, you had to be Jewish. To attend a Kulturbund performance, you had to be Jewish. Only Jews were allowed 
to attend Kulturban performances, with one uh, notable exception, that uh, first performance of The Marriage of Figaro was attended by a correspondent for the New York Times, and he wrote a glowing review of the, uh, that production uh, in which he sort of compared the production of what he called Mozart's holy opera with the thuggery that was going on in the streets just outside the Kulturbund Theater. So it was very much a closed organization. It was J Jews performing for Jews. And very soon thereafter, it was the only form of entertainment that the Jews of Germany could partake in, as it became illegal for a Jew to buy a ticket to hear the Berlin Philharmonic or to uh, even go to the local film uh, theater in Stuttgart or Hamburg or any other city in Germany. The Kulturbund was it but it provided extraordinarily high quality of performance for the Jews of Germany. In the book, I uh, take note of the fact that there is, in retrospect, a certain degree of controversy surrounding the Kulturbund in that, yes, it provided entertainment, sorely needed and sorely desired entertainment for the Jews of Germany, but there are those who wonder, again, in retrospect, and one might say in from the comfortable perspective of looking back on the time, uh, they raised questions as to whether it uh, provided a, a certain sense of normalcy for Jews and um, prevented them perhaps from seeking asylum elsewhere. I interviewed uh, a former dancer with the Kulturbund. She managed to get out in 1937 and she remembers that there were a number of her colleagues who said, why are you bothering to pull up stakes and move 3,000 miles across the ocean when this will all be done in a few months? But she says uh, those people who um, had that opinion stayed with the Kulturbund and later perished. As I say, my mother was 18 years old in that photograph. Uh, when she joined the Kulturbund Orchestra in Frankfurt. It was September 1935, and within a week of her first rehearsal with the Frankfurt Kulturbund Orchestra with Hans Wilhelm Steinberg conducting, came the uh, gathering in Nuremberg at which Jews were stripped of their citizenship. You may recall the headline in the Baltimore Sun that Professor Kaplan showed us. Um, my father, 22 years old at the time, decided that uh, rather than stay any longer in his homeland, he was going to emigrate to Sweden. And in fact, over the next several months, he found himself an apartment over a milk bar in Stockholm and was all set to, to move to Sweden. When the telephone rang in his apartment, he was studying the flute in Karlsruhe, a German city oh, 50 miles south of Frankfurt. And the man on the other end of the phone asked him if he would be able to fill in at short notice for a flutist who had come down with a very bad cold, a member of the Frankfurt Kulturbund Orchestra. And my father at first said, well, no, I, my apartment is full of boxes. I, there's no way that I can uh, take time out of my move to, to Sweden. But the fellow at the other end of the phone was quite persuasive, so my father, after a while, threw his flute and uh, a few items into a suitcase and found a train that took him up from Karlsruhe to Frankfurt, where he played two concerts with the Kulturbund Orchestra, one in Frankfurt and one in Hamburg, and then he duly moved off to his apartment over the milk bar in Sweden. However, he could not forget the lovely young violist he had met during those rehearsals and those two performances. And when the same flutist who had gotten sick in March of 1936, providing my father with the uh, possibility to play those concerts with the Kulturbund, when that same flutist emigrated to Palestine in the fall of 1936, my father moved back from the relative safety of Sweden to Nazi Germany to be with the woman who would later become his wife and my mother. And. Um, with your indulgence, I would just like to read a couple of paragraphs in my book about that part of the story. Again, my, my mother 
was named Rosemary Gumpert at the time. My father was Han, was uh, Gunther Ludwig Goldschmidt. And so uh, the, 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 the main piece on the program that they played in Frankfurt and Hamburg was the great Pathetic Symphony, the Symphony Number no. 6 by Tchaikovsky. And the next day after the last concert that uh, my father attended and performed with the Kulturbund, uh, my father mailed Rosemary a copy of Rainer Maria Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet. I have the little volume before me now, a precious relic. On the first page is the following inscription, in German, naturally. To Rosemary Gumpert, a small memento of two concerts, Tchaikovsky, in Frankfurt and Hamburg in March 1936, signed G.G. I wonder which of Rilke's gentle and profound observations made the greatest impression on the sender and on the recipient. Two in particular strike me. Rilke wrote, destiny is like a wonderful wide tapestry in which every thread is guided by an unspeakably tender hand placed beside another thread and held and carried by a hundred others. And Rilke also wrote, it is always my wish that you might find enough patience within yourself to endure and enough innocence to have faith. Believe me, life is right in all cases. A few days later, Gunther was thrilled to receive a return envelope from Frankfurt. Inside, he found an enthusiastic letter from Rosemary, thanking him for the book and expressing her happiness at having met him. But she had addressed the letter to Gustav Goldschmidt, apparently confusing him with the king of Sweden. <laughs> it must have been a wee bit exasperating for Gunther to think that he had made so little an impression upon the object of his affection that you couldn't even remember his name. But having inherited my mother's occasional difficulties with such matters, I can only smile with love and indulgence. What indeed is in a name? Thus began an ardent correspondence between Frankfurt and Stockholm. And believing, as did Rilke, in a beautifully woven destiny and in the rightness of life, Gunther, after spending six months in the white night safety of Sweden and engaging in a regular and intense correspondence with Rosemary, decided to go back to Germany to be near her. Foolishly or romantically, or both, my father accepted the position of principal flutist of the Frankfurt Kulturbund Orchestra. Would I have done the same thing? Whatever my answer, I have the advantage of hindsight of knowing the terrors of the next 10 years. But still, even in the late summer of 1936, my father must have known what a damn fool thing he was doing, deliberately and with all his faculties intact, voluntarily going back to Nazi Germany, to the country whose leader had vowed to eradicate his kind from the earth forever. And for what? Ah, for love. For music and for love. I don't know if I would have done it, but I do know that I love and admire him for it. I think it's the most wonderful story I know. Thank you. So for the next couple of years, uh, my parents played there in the Frankfurt Kulturbund Orchestra, in fact, taking part in that production of Rigoletto. You may remember the uh, uh, slide that Professor Kaplan put up there a production of, of uh, Rigoletto that the uh, Kulturbund put on. I should mention that at first uh, there was no restriction placed on the music that the Kulturbund might play, uh, although the Kulturbund was savvy enough to realize that to play music by Richard Wagner or Richard Strauss, favorites of the Nazis, probably wasn't a, a good idea. But everything else was okay until 1935 when the Gestapo ruled that for a Jew to perform music by Beethoven or Brahms or Bach or Schumann or any other great German composer, or for a Jewish actor to speak the words of Goethe or Schiller was to defile this great German art. So the Kulturbund Orchestra was only allowed to perform music by Jewish composers or foreign composers. So Mahler and Mendelssohn were certainly allowed as were 
Sibelius and Ravel and Carl Nielsen. Um, the, likewise, the theater company of the Kulturbund uh, found itself relying on Moliere and Shakespeare rather than Goethe or Schiller. So my parents were in the Kulturbund Orchestra in Frankfurt, 1938, 1939, 1940, by which time more and more Jews had emigrated from Germany, leaving fewer Jews to perform with the Kulturbund, fewer Jews to serve as audience members. So one by one, the outermost Kulturbund organizations were shut down. And uh, in 1938, um, the Kulturbund Orchestra in Frankfurt was eliminated. So my parents joined the, the Home Office in Berlin in uh, the summer of 1938 where they performed, as I say, in 1938, 39, and 1940. And through a series of very fortunate events, uh, my parents managed to uh, play a series of concerts at the American Embassy in Berlin. I should say that uh, that photograph that you may recall uh, of my mother and father and Henry Meyer playing a Beethoven trio was taken uh, during a house concert that my parents took part in. And they did it in a rather dangerous fashion in that there had been a curfew passed by the Nazis. Jews had to be off the streets by 8 p.m. during the winter time and 9 p.m. during the summertime. Other uh, edicts were passed against the Jews. Uh, Jews were not allowed to have pets. Driver's licenses of Jews were declared invalid Jewers were not allowed to have radios. Uh, they couldn't swim in the public uh, swimming area on Lake Wannsee in Berlin. And one by one, these various dictates were, were handed down. Um, most food stores were open between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And it was decreed that a Jew could not shop until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, by which time the fresh bread and vegetables and meat had been taken off the shelves and they were just allowed to buy whatever was left. So under those circumstances, they would still sneak out after curfew to play chamber music with their friends. And I think that it's highly possible that somehow I inherited the knowledge from my parents that music can not only enrich your life, it is also something worth risking your life for, which is quite literally what my parents did when they snuck through the streets uh, after playing some illegal Beethoven and Brahms as well. But because they had established themselves with the reputation of being very good chamber music players, they were allowed or they were invited to play a series of chamber music concerts at the American Embassy in Berlin, where they met a young woman my father remembered only as Mrs. Schneider. And Mrs. Schneider did two wonderful things for my, for my parents. Uh, first, my father told me that uh, she, during or after the concerts, there would often be a, a buffet table, and Mrs. Schneider introduced my father to this wonderful cheese from a faraway state known as Wisconsin. And secondly, and obviously far more importantly, she showed my parents how to fill out certain forms, which they were able to send to the correct uh, people in charge, which enabled them to achieve a visa, and then they were able to book passage on the good ship Mugino, which left Lisbon in early June of 1941, apparently the second to last boat leaving Lisbon with Jewish refugees. They arrived uh, on Ellis Island on June 22, 1941. My father remembers rousing my mother up at 4 o'clock in the morning so they could be on deck to, cast, to catch their first view of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, so they came to this country and established good uh, uh, lives for themselves. My mother played for 21 years with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra and then another uh, 14 years with the Cleveland Orchestra. So I was very fortunate to grow up in a, in a musical environment. But we are here to, to acknowledge the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht. And it was on the 9th of November, 1938, that my grandfather, Alex Goldschmidt, who had been awarded the 
Iron Cross second class for his contributions to the German efforts in World War I was uh, taken from his home on the 9th of March, 19, 9th of November, 1938, brought to the public square in the little town of Oldenburg in the northwest of Germany where he uh, lived and ran a woman's clothing store called the Haus der Mode. And uh, he was forced to stand at attention the rest of that night on November 9th, 1938. The following morning, November the 10th, he and 42 other adult male Jews were marched through the town of Oldenburg past uh, jeering citizens and sent to, uh, made to spend a night in the Oldenburg prison. The following morning, there were again marched through the town of Oldenburg, this time to the train station where they got on a train heading east to the concentration camp Sachsenhausen. Uh, my grandfather, Alex, spent a month in Sachsenhausen. He was then released with the understanding that he had six months to leave Germany or else face further arrest. So he made arrangements over those next six months to leave Germany. Uh, the plan was he would take his younger, younger son, my father's younger brother, Klaus Helmut Goldschmidt, and the two of them would get on a ship and head to the New World and plant the flag and establish a beachhead and send for the rest of the family. Alas, it was my grandfather's ill fortune to book passage on the refugee ship known as St. Louis which, as many of you know, uh, was turned away first from Cuba, then from the coast of Florida by the United States, turned away from Canada as well, and sent back to Germany. Uh, as it happens, uh, yesterday, after many years, uh, Justin Trudeau of Canada issued an apology, a public apology, uh, for Canada's having turned away the St. Louis. So the ship uh, sailed back to Europe, and with the help of uh, Ambassador Joseph Kennedy, uh, father of the future president, a deal was brokered whereby the passengers on board the St. Louis could disembark in one of three, one of four countries, England, France, Belgium, or Holland. My grandfather Alex and my uncle Helmut got off in France in Bologna-sur-Mer, certainly pleased that they weren't sent back to Germany. But they then spent the next three years being sent from one camp to another, from Boulogne-sur-Mer to Martigny-les-Bains, where they were on September 1st, 1939, when the Second World War broke out. My uh, grandfather and uncle metamorphosed in the eyes of the French overnight from being displaced persons to enemy aliens, and they were sent from, over the next three years, from Boulogne-sur-Mer to the town of Montauban, from Montauban to Agda, from Agda to Rivesalt, from Rivesalt to Camp Les Mille, where in August of 1942 they were sent by train first to the town of Drancy, just north of Paris, and from Drancy via Convoy 19 to Auschwitz, where my grandfather was immediately gassed. He was 62 years old. My uncle Helmut, uh, was sent to work in a brick factory in Auschwitz where he survived until October the 9th, 1942, when he died uh, officially of typhus, but very possibly from a, an injection of phenol into his heart, which was uh, done at the uh, uh, hospital where he, where he died. He was 21 years old. So this commemoration of Kristallnacht means a lot to, I know, all of you, and it certainly means a great deal personally to me. Uh, so it is, uh, I'm doubly thankful to uh, Michael Levitt and the Leo Beck Institute for allowing me to come and speak with you tonight. Thank you very much.